Hello and welcome. I'm Los Angeles City Council Member Mitch O'Farrell. I represent the 13th District, and I'd like to welcome you to my 70th Council Member in your corner. I appreciate everyone's patience. We had some techno technical difficulties, which is why we're starting a little late, but now we're, we're ready to go, so thank you for that. Uh, since taking office in 2013, I have made it a priority to go door to door in every neighborhood in the 13th District on a regular basis. It is more important now than ever to bring City Hall directly to you, now virtually, offering services and introducing residents to the people in your city government and our partners who make things happen for you every day. This, is, uh, this virtual edition is our 12th. Uh, we're going to focus on the Hollywood Community Plan Update a community-driven process that will guide future development and land use in the 13th District uh, neighborhoods of Hollywood, East Hollywood, Little Armenia, and Thai Town. But before I get started, I have two important announcements. In relation to our COVID-19 vaccination clinic, the photo you see was taken earlier this week in Elysian Valley, which uh, was the first day that my office uh, uh, has sponsored the clinic. Uh, we wanted to bring uh, vaccinations to people where they live, especially in communities that have sometimes been historically overlooked. So for the next uh, three weeks, we are doing these vaccination clinics. And so please stay tuned with my office on how you can get vaccinated and what the qualifications are. Very successful so far. And the sooner everyone gets vaccinated, the quicker we can get back to opening up this economy and making sure that everyone is protected from the coronavirus. Uh, the 13th District is home to many groups who have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. These include essential workers, seniors, and particularly communities of color who've been unable to reach city and county operated vaccination sites due to working long hours or travel barriers or accessibility issues. These local vaccination clinics help solve this challenge by bringing the vaccine directly to Angelinos in a safe and convenient way. Pre-registration for the vaccine is encouraged. Appointments will be scheduled from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Walk-ups will be accommodated from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. if supplies are available. Starting next Tuesday, March 16th, the vaccination clinic will travel to Clinica Romero in historic Filipino town followed by the Lemon Grove Recreation Center in East Hollywood the week of March 21st. And then down the road, we're going to do it all again so everyone can get their second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. If you'd like to schedule an appointment, please fill out the survey using the link in the comments section. In addition to our ongoing efforts to protect our most vulnerable residents from COVID-19, my office is continuing to identify temporary shelter options and interim and permanent housing solutions for people experiencing homelessness in the 13th district. Starting this Monday, March 15th, a new safe parking site is launching at the Coenga Branch Library on Santa Monica Boulevard in East Hollywood. This will be the third location I've secured in the district I represent, the 13th, in addition to sites in Echo Park and Hollywood. I'm thankful to Lhasa and the Los Angeles Public Library for partnering with my office in this endeavor. The site will provide 10 overnight spaces for people experiencing homelessness in their vehicles with case management and on-site security. We need your help though. Please help us spread the word. If you know of someone in need of a safe, secure location to sleep overnight, please let them know about this site. You can visit Safe Parking LA's website for more information the link is in the comments section of this broadcast. With that, let's move ahead with the program. I am thankful to have with me today our city planning department to explain what a community plan is and what the update of the Hollywood community plan entails. While our presenters will go into greater detail in just a moment, community plans play a critical role in shaping how our city evolves, especially in relation to housing production, job opportunities, and converse, uh, conservation of open space and natural resources, just to name a few. In Council District 13, each of these objectives is very important to me, in particular, affordable housing production 
and policies to protect renter households. Since taking office, I've advanced policies and projects that have increased our inventory of affordable housing while protecting renter households. This includes more than 2,000 units of coveted affordable housing that I have championed since taking office. This unit count includes projects in Hollywood, many of which are 100% affordable. Here are a few of them. The Hollywood Arts Collective, a project that just broke ground last month, will provide 151 units of affordable housing for artists and is being built on a former LADOT parking lot on Hollywood Boulevard between Wilcox and Schrader Avenues. In addition to artists, we're also making sure seniors on fixed incomes can continue to call Hollywood home. In 2019, we helped approve the Montecito Apartments, a 68-unit, 100% affordable senior housing project neighboring the Las Palmas Senior Center at Franklin and Las Palmas Avenues. In, uh, we are also uh, leading the way on supportive housing units created through the city's HHH bond measure passed by voters in LA in 2016. The 13th district is home to more than 600 units of HHH supportive housing, uh, the third most in the city uh, that are in the pipeline, have broken ground or already completed with residents, formerly homeless, now housed. In Hollywood, one such project is Path Villas Hollywood, which will provide 59 units of supportive housing to formerly homeless individuals. In addition to 100% affordable projects, I've also fought and negotiated for greater covenanted affordable housing and tenant right of return in mixed use market rate projects that require discretionary approval from the city. So in other words, we negotiate safety measures for future tenants who need affordable housing and existing tenants in danger of being displaced. As we work together to further these efforts and address our city's greatest challenges, the community's participation is critical. Let's hear more about all of this from the people leading this initiative. Joining me today are Deputy Director of City Planning and Chief Sustainability Officer Shauna Bonston, Principal City Planner Craig Weber, and senior city planner, Priya Mandel. Also joining me from my staff is Craig Bullock, planning director for Council District 13. So let's start with Craig. Uh, what can you tell us about your role as planning director in general for the 13th district? Well, good morning. Uh, my job primarily involves reviewing of the many applications that are um, submitted to the Department of City Planning so that we can uh, look to articulate a position of support for this project. The council offices play a very important role in the planning processes, as does the Department of City Planning, neighborhood councils, and the various commissions that we have. I'd like to make a recommendation that is tailored to the projects that uh, we are evaluating, and knowing that we have to factor in such things as the community plan, zoning, city ordinances, and state law, and of course, community benefits. The many lenses that shape recommendations can certainly be limiting, um, but we strive to achieve the best possible outcomes. And um, I have to say that one of the benefits of my job is that I get to rely and work with many of the professionals in the various city departments who help craft um, good recommendations to make the projects um, the best they can be so that Los Angeles can be a better place to live. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. And uh, Craig is very modest, but I, I have uh, nearly 20 years in the city now, and I've never met anyone who knows more uh, about the various community plans, about uh, zoning law, uh, and the history and trajectory of planning, zoning, the housing element, et cetera. Craig is a real problem solver in my office, and he always figures out a way to uh, make sure that the development projects that get approved are more beneficial for the community and especially uh, those who need affordable housing. So Craig, thank you so much for all your great work on behalf of the 13th district. Um, a thank quick, you. Sure, a quick reminder here is we'll be taking questions at the end of the program. So if you have a question, please leave it in the comments section of this broadcast. Now on to city planning. 
Uh, so city planning, and I'm not sure who's gonna take this one, but uh, um, what can you tell us about the Hollywood community plan update? Sure, so thank you so much, Council Member O'Farrell. Uh, my name is Priya Mahendale, senior city planner, and um, alongside my colleagues, De Deputy Director Shauna Bonston and Principal City Planner Craig Weber, we really appreciate the invitation and also the opportunity to tell more people about the Hollywood Community Plan. Um, the topic is a timely one as we're slated to return to the City Planning Commission next Thursday on March 18th. So the Community Planning Program, which includes the Hollywood Community Plan, it's a central component of our department's work program. So through both a citywide and a community by community planning lens, we're able to develop strategies and neighborhood specific planning tools to guide future growth and development in the city. So first, if we take a step back for a moment to take a look at our city at a glance. So LA, is, as many of us know, is the second largest city in the US with about a population of over 400 million people speaking over 200 different languages. And it covers quite a large area of about 469 square miles and consists of really varied natural features. So we have mountains and beaches, the Los Angeles River, as well as a dense urban, suburban, and also some semi-rural neighborhoods. So to address the city's ongoing housing needs, we as a city have a number of policy documents that help inform local land use decisions, everything from zoning regulations to citywide conversations on new land use initiatives. And those conversations often become more real when we take the citywide goals and objectives and then apply them at a more local and more neighborhood level. So in the case of Hollywood, it's part of the city that is widely known for its crit critical role in the development of and also its continued role in the entertain, in entertainment industry. But Hollywood is also a collection of neighborhoods with diverse cultural and ethnic histories. So there's also a diverse mix of land uses and topographies in Hollywood. So we have large expanses of open space, which include um, Runyon Canyon and Griffith Park, hillsides, and also more urbanized areas in the flatlands that have a mix of multifamily and single family residential neighborhoods, as well as multiple centers of commercial and industrial uses too. And of course, Hollywood is an important job center in the city and it employs about 6% of our city's workforce. And all of this is essentially housed within 25 square miles of the planned boundaries, which are shown here on the map and it extends south of the city of Burbank, west of the Los Angeles River, generally north of Melrose Avenue, and then east of the cities of West Hollywood and Beverly Hills. So I wanted to just first explore the question of how we plan for so many stakeholders across really such a large geographic region that makes up the city of LA. So with that first just touching on long range planning in general, and a good place to start when we do talk about long range planning in the city is the general plan. So the general plan serves as a blueprint for the future and it sets policy goals and objectives that shape and guide the physical development of the city. So we can think of the general plan kind of like a book um, in that it's made up of chapters that are devoted to different topics. And each chapter which we referred to as an element of the general plan covers an aspect of the urban environment. So while the state of California mandates that the general plan has to have at least seven elements, um, it doesn't necessarily prescribe rules on how they're organized. So Los Angeles's general plan currently consists of 12 different elements, which are shown here on the slide. So the housing element is one of those required elements and it integrates our housing and growth strategies to support the city's economic interests and housing needs, and also addresses issues related to housing supply and also housing affordability. And we're actually in the midst of an update of our housing element right now. 
and we're working with our city agencies and different communities to create a draft plan that will establish clear goals and objectives to help inform future housing decisions in the city. And when the ongoing update to the housing element is completed, it'll set the city's housing policy from 2021 through 2029. And the housing element will also look at developing citywide programs to address anti-displacement, including increased protections for tenants, as well as other measures to expand affordable housing opportunities throughout the city. And again, this is happening at a city lo citywide level to ensure greater equity and consistency. So as I just noted, um, Los Angeles's general plan has 12 different elements. And one of those elements is the land use element, which is made up of 35 community plans. And these community plans delve further into neighborhood policies. Because of the sheer size of LA's, of Los Angeles, and also the unique characteristics of its various neighborhoods, community plans really set the specific neighborhood level policies for clearly defined geographic areas. And along with other general plan elements, the community plans play an important role in infor informing future development. So city planners, as well as decision makers, consult these policy documents when they're reviewing applications for new development projects. So now this brings us to the Hollywood community plan. Uh, the plan consists of policies that reflect a future vision for neighborhoods, and it designates land for a range of different uses. So this includes um, uses related to jobs or housing, transportation, open space, and various amenities. So the last update to the Hollywood Community Plan was back in 1988. And of course, a lot has changed over time. Um, since it was last updated. And there's definitely a need for a land use plan that really addresses current and our evolving community issues, such as what are we doing to better address climate change, as well as a plan that balances community and city goals, such as bolstering Hollywood's media and entertainment industry, while also expanding opportunities for affordable housing and access and opportunities for affordable housing. And also a plan that guides decision making for discretionary development in the future. So public engagement throughout the duration of the plan update process really helped us identify a key, key number of different priorities that have informed the policies and land use recommendations of the proposed plan. So these priorities include the need for more housing, um, including affordable housing, particularly in areas that are near transit. Another priority of the plan is a vibrant regional center and vibrant commercial corridors. So the regional center in Hollywood is near the Metro Beeline stations of Hollywood Highland and Hollywood, um, Hollywood and Vine. And this area is envisioned as um, a part of Hollywood that has a mix of housing, jobs, as well as visitor serving uses. And then our commercial corridors are streets that are served by Metro, Metro Rapid and local bus lines. Hollywood is internationally known for its media and entertainment industry. So one of the planned priorities is to expand opportunities for media and technology, technology jobs as well. So there's a number of historic and cultural resources in Hollywood, and they continue to serve as assets that have an important role in fostering positive neighborhood identity. And they also serve really as a, a source of cultural and civic pride. So here we have a photo as an example um, of the city's first UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is the Hollywalk, Hollyhock House in Barnstall Art Park. And historic preservation is a priority of the plan update as Hollywood has a number of designated and eligible historic resources and districts. While the plan area has two large regional parks, there's still um, a need for more opportunities to expand recreation and open space. So the plan prioritizes open space through policies to improve and expand um, trail connections for also better access to parks, 
and also ways to provide more smaller parks and public open space, particularly in the more urban areas of Hollywood. Another priority is to limit construction related impacts in the hillsides and to conserve open space areas for wildlife movement and also to limit new development in the hillside areas to the extent possible. Another priority is to have more options in the way we get around. Um, Hollywood is transit accessible and in order to improve air quality and to better address climate change in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the plan prioritizes more options in the way we get around. So it aims to make it easier and also safer for pedestrians and bicyclists to move through and within Hollywood. So to follow up on the priorities that I just covered, um, in the next two slides, I'll go over the proposed changes to the Hollywood Community Plan to implement those priorities. So this includes the creation of an affordable housing incentive program that'll encourage the production of new mixed income and 100% affordable housing projects along transit surf corridors and also within the regional center of Hollywood, which is in central Hollywood. And open space and parks have really an important role in contributing to a healthy and happy community. So the plan includes new development incentives within the regional center that link the provision of on-site public open space to increase development rights. So this will be a way to add more public open space in some of the denser parts of Hollywood. And these are areas where there's currently limited access to park space. Um, another proposed change is to expand the types of commercial uses allowed in Central Hollywood. So the changes would also have more, create more flexibility that will create greater economic opportunities for businesses in the regional center, um, particularly for smaller businesses looking to reinvest in the recovery of our city um, post pandemic. So the existing zoning here um, in terms of what uses are currently permitted is a bit dated. Um, it speaks to a past area where certain uses such as um, secondhand stores or gyms, pool halls, and other types of amusement enterprises required um, discretionary approval from the city. So this change allows a wider variety of uses and hopefully will reduce development hardships for some business owners, um, which again will be particularly important in our future economic recovery. Another proposed change is aimed to address the need to better balance visitor and tourist serving uses with residential uses. So to that end, the proposed plan to prohibit, um, the, the plan, excuse me, proposes to prohibit new hotels in certain multifamily residential areas. And in, in the regional center, which is located again in central Hollywood, it would require planning approvals for new hotels that remove or replace existing residential uses. And the plan includes changes to help promote employment opportunities, particularly in an area known as the Media District, which is south of Santa Monica Boulevard. So the proposed changes include restricting residential uses and then creating incentives for projects that provide job producing uses. So if a project provides a certain amount of media related uses, they could get an increase in development rights. And by media related uses, we mean supportive uses that have a critical role in media and film. So this includes things like media production facilities, which involve pre or post production, uh, prop storage and studio equipment manufacturing. And then in terms of historic preservation and infill design, the plan acknowledges the importance of historic buildings and sites in Hollywood. And through a zoning implementation tool that we call uh, the CPIO, which is a community plan implementation overlay, we're proposing numerous strategies to protect historic resources and provide economic incentives to restore and rehabilitate a number of historic buildings. So, for example, the CPIO doesn't allow for buildings to be demolished until a replacement project is approved and provides a streamlined process for projects that aim to restore buildings 
Um, whereas projects that involve demolition or significant change would re be required to have a lengthier and a more involved review process. The CPIO also allows for unused floor area on a historic site to be transferred to another development site. And this creates an economic incentive for buildings to be restored and appropriately rehabilitated. And the plan also seeks to improve urban design throughout Hollywood by proposing new development standards for projects to improve pedestrian oriented design, particularly in commercial areas that are near transit. Another proposed change is new limitations on hillside construction and grading. So these include limits on the amount of grading for single family homes, um, standards on hauling truck equipment and the number of trips, and it also addresses construction, construction hours. And these new regulations for grading and construction in the hillsides are intended to preserve the natural topography of these areas. And then the plan also includes rezoning of additional land for open space. And this includes about uh, 300 acres in the hillside areas that will be changed from residential to open space. And a lot of these properties are recent parkland acquisitions in the Hollywood Hills. And the change will ensure that they remain as permanent open space. And the proposed change will also preserve vacant hillside areas for conservation purposes. So the Hollywood Community Plan update has been a multi-year process that's involved significant stakeholder input to really help shape the policies and also the proposed land use changes. So the next steps um, include the upcoming City Planning Commission meeting and following that um, on to City Council for adoption. We'd really like to thank all the stakeholders that have been participating in the Hollywood Plan Community Plan update process so far. Um, and as mentioned, the Commission meeting will be happening next week on Thursday, uh, March 18th, and people can participate by calling in or attending the meeting virtually and the meeting details, including login information, can be found on our planning website, planningforla.org. So we've reached the, the end of the formal presentation. Again, thank you so much for inviting us and also giving us the opportunity to share more about the Hollywood Community Plan Update with stakeholders. Priya, thank I you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank, thank you. you. I know Sean and Craig are here also. Uh, and so uh, thank you so much for that overview of the Hollywood Community Plan update. Um, it's been a long time coming. It's the oldest community plan in the city of Los Angeles from 1988. Um, I'll bet that many of the stakeholders involved in the uh, input so far weren't even born yet when the community plan update was last updated. So this is really great. Uh, so uh, with uh, Priya and Shauna and Craig and and, and Craig in the 13th district. Uh, we're ready to take some questions then. Councilman, how can the Hollywood Community Plan ensure set-asides for affordable housing? All right, set-asides for affordable housing. Um, how about, uh, uh, let's, have, uh, let's have Craig Bullock just take the first stab at that one because that's something that we've worked on extensively and then we can turn it over uh, to the planning department. Thank you. And I was seven when the last community plan was done. But at any rate, <laughs> uh, I wanted to um, say that the Hollywood community plan creates like an incentive system to get affordable housing units into the buildings. And what we are looking at is a base and bonus system, if you will, to incentivize developers to actually get affordable units included in the income restricted ranges that we're looking to achieve. Um, for Hollywood, and it's it's very similar um, in concept to like the TOC program, um, which will be more memorialized in the community plan as the TOC is a uh, it will go away eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will um, ask uh, uh, Craig or Shana to weigh in more on specifics. 
Hi there, Craig. Yes. Uh, thank you for uh, noting in particular the, the plan's proposed base bonus system. So really what this is describing is that the zoning for various parts of Hollywood will set uh, base development rights, looking in particular at building square footage and then in some cases building height. Um, and then projects that, that include uh, the required percentage of affordable housing. So for example, um, I believe 10% of, uh, of units restricted for very low income households, um, as an example. Uh, those projects can ex exceed those base development rights with greater floor area. So we've taken great care to um, articulate this system across Hollywood in a way that is, is sensitive to the existing neighborhood environment and really seeks to maximize those parts of Hollywood that can uh, best accommodate the, the most uh, future housing. So for example, we heard a lot about the regional center and that's, that's an area where both base and then both bonus floor area rights would be uh, among the greatest. Um, and then along many of our corridors, we see a much more tailored version of the same system. Um, and Craig, you also mentioned that this is, this is um, consistent in theme with today's TOC guidelines. And, and that is true. This is really an attempt to tailor those guidelines to uh, the existing neighborhood context. And then this same concept of, of base and bonus uh, zoning is something that we pursue uh, really with, with all of our community plan updates. So this is, this is a repetition of a theme that we saw in prior plan updates in the South Los Angeles area. Um, and this theme is continued in, in other proposed plan updates, uh, thinking, for example, about downtown and Boyle Heights communities. So this sort of incentive-based zoning system has really been um, a significant tool in, in both generating housing production generally, uh, and then in particular in, in facilitating new affordable housing. Thank you, Shauna. Would you take a stab and, and let's talk about what TOC stands for. Yeah, I can be the acronym uh, describer uh, for the team. Uh, TOC is Transit Oriented Communities, and that is part of our program that came out of Measure JJJ um, and is borrowing from density bonus law to kind of look at this idea of a base and then a bonus when you get uh, when you provide affordable housing. And as Craig mentioned, you know, this is really based on what we've seen to be very successful in the provision of housing and affordable housing throughout the city. So starting with density bonus and then TOC, and uh, so this is kind of uh, a growth out of that successful program. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. Uh, how about we do the next question? Councilman, can you share specific examples of times when you've demanded more affordable housing and tenant protections in new projects in your district? That's a great question. We've done so many of those and, and so much of that. Um, two, two come to mind off the top of my head. Um, Yucca at Argyle is a project uh, that's a redevelopment project where we baked into the entitlement process a right to return at the existing uh, rent stabilized uh, afford, uh, ordinance uh, monthly rent. Uh, and so folks who are temporarily um, have to temporarily relocate to another site can come back in the new structure and still be under RSO with the rent that they are currently paying. Uh, another one that comes to mind is over at Crossroads, which is uh, roughly sunset at Cherokee, just south of Selma. We did the same thing there uh, with right to return. Uh, and uh, protections uh, similar uh, to that and planning can, can expand much greater. Um, those experiences uh, are going to be represented in the Hollywood Community Plan update. Some of the things that we've negotiated in the past are now being baked into the Community Plan update so we can uh, build even more covenant affordable housing. And just so everyone's really clear, RSO is only affordable temporarily because once an, a unit is vacated, then the price of that unit shoots up to market rate. Covenant affordable is very different and actually gives uh, long-term protections, uh, 55 years, uh, at, at, at an affordable uh, rate for that particular unit. So the, increasing the production of covenant affordable is really important um, as we protect RSO uh, to the absolute best of our ability at the same time. Thank you. Councilman. How will the Hollywood Community Plan ensure that the community will not lose their say on what's built in their neighborhoods? All right, so 
that's a question about community process, which uh, this, just getting to this point, um, I can think of dozens of community meetings we had before the formalized uh, commission process. So who would like to take a stab at what the community process will be as we readopt and update the community plan and then afterward as the projects come forward for proposals? Um, I, I can speak briefly to that. Um, I mean, I think, Councilman, as you acknowledged, a great deal of public participation is focused on, on the development of the community plan itself. And so one of the kind of foundational goals here is to establish up front what the, what the expectations are for projects and investments in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. uh, today, we have a, a system where, as, as has been acknowledged, our current community plan is, is significantly out of date. And thus, a lot of projects that, that many would say probably make sense in a denser urbanized area are required to go through uh, very extensive um, and, and, and frankly expensive entitlements that, that really escalate the cost of housing in particular. So mm -hmm. what the plan is trying to do is, is really understand the, the priorities and needs of, of stakeholders across Hollywood and to articulate the regulations accordingly. So here that means, uh, in particular today, a really focused dialogue about affordable housing, how much is included within particular projects, um, and then a number of, of other um, supportive uh, policies and programs looking at safeguarding existing renting households. Um, and that, that public dialogue is ongoing as we make our way through uh, planning commission and then um, future steps of our process aimed at the city council. Um, so really what the plan is trying to do is, is formalize and clarify regulations looking toward the year 2040. Thank you, Craig. It's basically a framework of allowable uses, right? And so when a, there's a proposal, uh, everyone understands that framework, the community, uh, the development community. And so there's clarity in what might be allowable and what might not be. And then that invites a public process. Uh, to work within the parameters that everyone fully understands. Very well said. <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, next question. Councilman, how can the Hollywood Community Plan be used to leverage underutilized city-owned properties to create more affordable housing? Question about leveraging underutilized city properties. Well, I'll give you one example. Uh, we talked about it a little bit earlier, and that is uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Hollywood Arts Collective, which is over on Schrader, just south of Hollywood Boulevard, which is a city-owned parking lot. And so this is a project that I've worked on from my first few months in office, and it's under construction now. It's 151 units of covenanted affordable housing, 100% affordable housing. Um, and it's intended uh, for artists, but will not be exclusively for artists. Um, uh, because, you know, we want to support the creative class in Los Angeles. This is the kind of project that I would have loved to have existed back when I moved here as an actor and a dancer in the early 80s, but that didn't exist. So it, it, in a way, this project is personal for me because we want to support the creative class as best we can. Now, this is on a former city parking lot, as I mentioned, and it also, we negotiated space for an art gallery and for other artistic uses that will front Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, so this is a really great example of the kinds of incentives that will bake, be baked into the plan. So would anyone care to elaborate on, on the community plan updates uh, specific uh, to uh, publicly owned properties? Sure, I can take this one. Thanks, Priya. Yeah, so just to follow up on, on the theme of surplus properties, the community plan or policy document does have specific policies that that touch on this and they call for um, prioritizing affordable housing on surplus city-owned sites. Great, and that, uh, that's so it's affordable and permanent supportive housing is incentivized. Yes, Great. that's correct. Thank you. Our next question is about preservation of historic resources. How does the plan ensure this protection of historic resources? Preservation of historic resources, something really important to my office, um, as is evidenced by so many of the now registered landmarks uh, under my watch in Hollywood. But who would like to uh, expand 
on the incentives to protect historic resources? Um, I can speak to that council member. This has really been an important part of what the plan is seeking to accomplish. And, and it probably goes without saying that Hollywood's many historic resources are, are important both to the local community. Uh, these are sites that are often nationally or internationally recognized um, they have tremendous potential in terms of future economic investment and development in Hollywood. Uh, so there's just a lot of universal acceptance that we really want to be focusing on safeguarding historic resources. Uh, so the plan does a couple of key things that are that are worth noting and that, that Priya highlighted earlier um, in the presentation. So uh, there are a lot of new processes that are intended to ensure that historic sites are not demolished without a thought. Um, and that really ensuring that, that a replacement project is completely thought out, understood and approved before um, any sort of demolition occurs. Um, and then looking at the, the process in which a project is approved, a lot of attention is paid to really streamline the process for projects that are preserving or rehabilitating existing sites, historic sites. Uh, whereas there would be a lengthier discretionary process with uh, a really public oriented process mm -hmm. um, in instances where rehabilitation is, is not being considered. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, it's really important. This is, these are kind of bureaucratic procedures that are, that are difficult to speak to, but are, are really important to ensure that, that resources are not lost without a thought. Mm -hmm. um, something new and, and very exciting that, that Priya also mentioned is this idea of called transfer of development rights. So, you know, when you think about some parts of Hollywood and in particular the regional center, there's a lot of capacity there to build large buildings. And oftentimes we have smaller historic buildings that we all agree should be saved and retained. And so what the plan would allow to happen is for unused square footage to be sold and transferred away from that site to a receiving development site. Um, so that both facilitates development on another, another site where perhaps it makes more sense and also creates a viable economic tool to ensure that, that existing resources can be rehabilitated and, and, and can continue to, to be a part of the urban fabric of, of Hollywood. I think lastly, it's also worth noting, a lot of attention has been paid to um, what the development capacity is within various historic districts in the core of Hollywood. So there are some really tailored strategies, looking in particular at some of the lower scale neighborhoods at portions of the National Register District on Hollywood Boulevard, um, just to ensure that the, the, the building envelope and the development potential there is, is right-sized as it pertains to those, those really sensitive and unique locations. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah, you know, time is money, right? So if we streamline the process for proposals that seek to preserve historic resources, then in the long run, they're gonna say, because we're gonna, we're gonna really help them uh, because what they're doing is giving back to the community by preserving uh, a valuable property uh, that, of historic value. So uh, that's great. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have time for a few more? One more? Okay. Our last question. The community plan CPIO district currently has extremely low income, very low income, and low income thresholds for housing. Are there any plans to encourage housing for moderate income households in the Hollywood community plan area? Okay, great. This is another sort of base level question, I think about the, the incentives for the various levels of income from moderate uh, to workforce to very low income. Who would like to take a stab at that? Sh uh, Shauna? I'll, I'll push that one to Craig if you don't mind. Okay, yeah, um, all, all good. <laughs> uh, I think that was to Mr. Bullock, right? I will take that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, so this is really speaking to, again, this, this new permanent system to facilitate affordable housing in, in, in Hollywood and, and how that works with the base bonus concept that we described earlier. So um, for all intents and purposes, as we mentioned earlier, projects can build bigger if they provide a requisite amount of affordable housing. Um, and those requirements tend to be geared toward lower income households. So as was noted in the question, very low income, low income, extremely low. Um, but we do hear a lot from, from stakeholders, it, both in Hollywood and throughout the city, about the need to uh, safeguard housing opportunities for folks who aren't necessarily within those economic bra brackets. And that really does speak to an extent about um, a lack of affordable housing across the spectrum for so many people in Los Angeles. So, so something that we're looking at here in Hollywood in particular 
um, within the regional center is for projects that have satisfied those initial set asides of affordable housing, low, very low income. Um, there's still room to build up in the regional center. The, there, we're looking at, at floor area ratios that are, are fairly high. And so for projects to continue to bonus up, if they've satisfied uh, the initial very low income requirements, um, projects can then incorporate set aside housing for moderate or above moderate income households. So that's looking at, at folks who are around 120 or 150% of area median, median income, which tends to mean around 90 to $100,000 in annual income for a household of four. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's now an option to safeguard housing for those households, but we do want to prioritize um, uh, lower income households first. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a layered system, um, but we really are trying to acknowledge the, the vast uh, array of needs of different housing types here. Thank you. One thing we've learned since the urban renewal period of the 60s and 70s is that mixed income neighborhoods work best, right? They make uh, neighborhoods more vibrant. Um, and so we always encourage mixed use, mixed income uh, development uh, in the neighborhoods that I represent uh, because we know that that's more just, it's more equitable, uh, and it's really what people are crying out for. Uh, so, so with that, uh, I want to thank our incredible panelists, and really, I got to thank the planning department, Shauna, Priya, Craig, for your years of work uh, to really be responsive to the communities all across the city. Um, you all do so much great work that people don't even know about and they never hear about, uh, but you take all of the things that you hear, all the input that is given to you, and then you transform it into actual policy and then people get another round uh, to make those considerations that you've put forward after listening to, to all that input. So we really want to thank you for that. I think it bodes well for a successful Hollywood Community Plan update. We're not nearly done. As you mentioned, there's that hearing on the 18th. And so uh, we, will, we will get through this and we will end up with a product that is well informed, that is fair, and that strikes the right balance in Hollywood, I am sure of it. Uh, so thank you so much for all the great questions, everyone who's been tuning in. Um, we don't have uh, time for any more, but we will answer all the questions that are on the Facebook live stream. And we'll, so those will all be followed up with by my team. So uh, thanks again for joining me today. I especially want to thank the crew here at uh, the city's Channel 35 studios for making today possible. As I mentioned, this is my 12th virtual council member in your corner my 70th overall. We believe in this mission of bringing information that we, uh, to people where they are. Uh, and so we're really uh, privileged to have the use of the studio. Please sign up for my weekly newsletter on cd13.com for information on our next council member in your corner. Uh, and uh, keep watching out for those vaccinations. Let's all get vaccinated so we can Go out in public sooner rather than later, and we can get this economy revving again and get people back to work and on a path to wellness. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate your time. Be well. Thank you.